We are joined by Richard. He is the head of customer success at Vertiso. He is going to be speaking to us about optimizing uh, onboarding to reduce early stage churn. So please give a warm welcome. Handing over to you, Richard. Thanks very much, Shreya. Um, what I'll do is is I'll share my screen. So give me just two seconds. And here we go. Um, it's, it's lovely to get to speak to you all and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody here. Uh, my name is Richard. I'm the head of customer success at Virtuoso. And um, I'm talking to you today about a topic that I'm incredibly passionate about, and that's op optimizing onboarding to reduce early stage churn. Now, I've worked in the SaaS world for probably about 13 years now, um, most of which has been has, has had some form of onboarding or implementation um, as, as part of my role. And for me, it's a very exciting time where you can start to form really strong relationships with customers um, and you can uh, you can understand the value that the customer is trying to, to get from, from your platform and help them solve problems, right? Um, so the, the things that I'm going to be talking about today, I've got a list of topics here. So I'm going to talk about the importance of onboarding and the benefits. So why do we care? Why is it important that um, that we really do spend time on uh, making sure that we've got a great onboarding process? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about an onboarding maturity curve. And the idea behind this and most of today is for me to um, get you to have a think about your onboarding process and reflect on areas where you can improve. Right. So even if you've got uh, an onboarding process that you've iterated over for a long time and it's and it's going fantastically well, you can always improve it. Right. So, so let's have a look at the maturity curve and, and where you could perhaps um, start to improve from there. I'm then going to have a look at the, the processes, both internal and external, uh, and, and what you can do or things to consider um, as, as you are, I suppose, uh, yeah, optimizing that process, if that makes sense. Uh, and then I'm going to leave you with a couple of, couple of things in the sales handover and the kickoff. I think these two are very, very important on, in the onboarding process. Um, so I'm going to leave you with some questions that I tend to ask or reflect upon um, when it comes to those areas of the onboarding process. And then we'll do a quick Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions as you're going through, please um, ping them in the chat and we'll pick them up at the end. And uh, looking forward to, to talking to you um, a little bit later on in the, the presentation. So a big thanks to some friends of mine over at Guide CX who have provided me for, with some, some stats here, right? So $138 billion is actually lost in avoidable churn per year in the US alone. And 23% of churn is attributed to bad onboarding. That's a huge statistic. That is 23% of churn is attributed to bad onboarding. And that's something that is fully within our control, right? Assuming that you know the, the customer is, is the right fit for us, because I think that's worth taking into consideration. Um, but yeah, that's something that was within our control. And so we can continuously iterate and improve to make sure that that is reduced. Um, there was a, a study done by the Harvard, Harvard Business School that claims that on average, 5% increase in customer retention um, results in 25 to 95% increase in profits and 65% of, of a company's business comes from existing customers, right? So there's a whole load of statistics around this. It doesn't take away from the fact that actually what we do need to do is focus on the customer and the value and then those statistics will improve as a result. OK, uh, and one last thing I wanted to share with you from Gain Sites: 39 percent say the number one reason for churn is not meeting expectations. So let's make sure that we know what the customer's expectations are. We help to set them from the word go. Um, and so what we're going to be doing today is, is instead of focusing on the, these statistics around the around the negative, around the churn side of things. Right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on the positive, how we can make positive changes um, to reduce the churn, increase the customer lifetime value and et cetera, et cetera. So moving on to the benefits. I've got benefits categorized into two, two categories here, right? So we've got the end customer and the provider, the vendor, you guys. Um, so from, from the customer's perspective, 
great onboarding results in faster time to value because they're, they're purchasing your tool or your service for the value that you provide. So the quicker you can get there, the happier the customer is. They also gain increased confidence in you as a vendor, in your tool. Um, they might have may have picked you from a long list of vendors and you want to make sure that you help them to feel like they've made the right choice, especially with companies where they've got... Um, you might have like a trial period where they can opt out. So after after the first month, two, three months or something, you need to instill that confidence in them. You're reducing the frustration of the end users. I think a smooth and effective onboarding process, which includes training, um, that will enable the, the customer to go faster because there's nothing nothing more frustrating than being enthusiastic about product and you're wanting to use it, but you come up into blockers and, and you're not able to achieve what you want to achieve. So each one of those customers will have improved product knowledge. And again, that means that not, not just on, on the areas that they've purchased, right? So think about this. You might have a number of different products within your suite and the customers purchase one. This is a fantastic opportunity for you to educate them on other areas of the business. Now, those things might not necessarily be right for them right now, but actually educating them on those areas showcases your entire suite and it plants the seed for upsell. And it also gives them a vision of where they can be in the future. And clear expectations, this, this is on both sides. So the customer needs to understand what the process is, where they fit into it, where they can get the most value, and you gain a solid understanding of the customer goals and you can work to continuously deliver them to the customer. So let's let's flip over to the other side. Let's have a look at about the, the vendor, about the software company's benefits to great onboarding. From a monetary perspective, you get an increased customer lifetime value. Customers are going to be happier. They're going to stay with you longer and they're going to continue to spend. And that leads on to the cross-sell and upsell opportunities, right? Um, if they if they see the value in what you are doing from the outset, from the from the services and the products you're providing, they're likely to invest more in you in your product, so they get more value in return. So this becomes an investment for them. It's not just a cost; it is it's actually an investment. You get improved customer satisfaction, and happy customers are, are more likely to tell others about your product. Okay, whether it be within the company. Uh, online community events, perhaps, and happy customers are your biggest marketing assets through case studies, online reviews, referrals, and it's it's a hell of a lot cheaper to get referrals and and upsells through existing customers than it is to spend money on you know bringing bringing leads in from from elsewhere. An important one is, is reduced support costs. And anyone who has ever worked in, in a support um, or a service desk before will, will understand the frustration of customers not being onboarded properly and customers asking very basic questions that, that they should have found out about and, and be educated on during the onboarding phase. So you have fewer questions. The questions that do come over are actually probably more genuine um, as to what to, you know, perhaps might, might be might be a bug that they found in the system or, or how to do more complicated things. And, and that's okay, right? But if we can improve the training that's delivered, the low-level support requests are going to reduce as well. And uh, lastly, onboarding can be a real competitive advantage for you. So do something that your, custom, your, your competitors don't, and that is take care of your customers. Um, and it's okay to bring the onboarding team to the late stage prospect calls to give them the confidence that they're going to be looked after, show them what it's, what it's like to be a customer, talk them through um, the onboarding process, have a nice little presentation that you can talk through to say, this is what things are going to look like over the next coming weeks and months. And some things that aren't listed on here include the fact that it's, it's less stressful for your team. If you've got a good onboarding process, um, onboarding should be enjoyable because it's, it's actually a really positive stage in the, in the customer process. Like they're coming into the, your company with a lot of momentum. Um, and it's a really good chance to meet new people, build new relationships and, and make people happy because you're solving their problems. Okay, so if we move on to the, onto the maturity curve, 
we've got on the, on the far left hand side here, we've got the ad hoc, right? You're, you're very reactive to things. You don't have any project management. Um, you don't have any experience, uh, expectation management. Um, the onboarding from sales might be poor or non-existent. You just kind of pick things up and see how it goes. And, and everybody set, tends to get the same onboarding experience, regardless of the size of the customer, the tier they're in, the um, the upsell opportunity, the the industry, all of those kind of good segmentation pieces that can, that can come in. Right the way up to the, the far right-hand side, so we're talking about the proactive stuff. You've got customer-facing platforms where the customer can log in and see in real time what's going on with the implementation. And, and I'll, I'll note on this that, most of this is to do with high touch um, onboarding, right? I think this would be very different from a, from a low touch perspective. Um, but the customer can go in and, and have a look at what's going on, get real time updates, maybe even have communication with you across those platforms, um, possibly even embedded workflows into your into the core application. And what I mean by that, you might have an overlay software where the customer wants to find out how to create a quote for example depending on what your product does right how to create a quote and then you've got the um the application tells them right click here now click here type this in here click here there you go it's as simple as that um so some of these things is trying to, you're trying to automate as much as possible without taking away the personal touch okay it's okay to have automation in the right in the right places um You've got automated sequences and workflows. So you might have emails and information being presented to the customer at the right time, be that asking for information, or it might be educating them. Perhaps they've gone to a new part of the system they've never been to before, or they haven't visited for several months. What you can do is have an automated workflow that says, here you go, here's some information about X, Y, and Z. It points them to a video. It kind of explains what they're trying to look at. Um, I think it's important for the teams to be able to articulate the value as well, right? This is something that sales are very good at, is articulating the value and the benefits of the product. And I think in CS, there's a lot of focus on the, the features and functionality. But why does the customer buy that application from you? Because they're trying to solve a problem. That is the value, right? The value behind that problem. So make sure that your teams can articulate the value and then finally, you've got centralized reporting. You've got so many different systems, okay? So you might have one system for reporting on system usage. You might have another system for um, for your CRM and things. And actually, with, with all this information all over the place, you want to make sure that you can your, your customer success managers, your onboarding consultants, your implementation consultants can view all of that holistically. But also... You want to be able to step back and have a look at the reporting and see what's working well and perhaps what isn't working so well. It's OK to know that, that some things aren't particularly great in, in your process as long as you understand it and you make improvements on it. OK, so, um, yeah, I'll, that's that's the, the first bit of the maturity curve. And, and I want to share something else with you. I came across this. This is from from Rocket Lane. And um, and I, I will share this presentation with Treya, and I'm sure we'll be able to, for anyone who wants to see this, I'm sure we'll be able to share it with you. This was a lovely onboarding maturity model, right? And it allows you to go in and assess for each one of these categories here, give yourself a score and be honest, right? Give yourself a score, one to five, one to 10, whatever it is, and assess how well you're doing those particular areas. And then from there, what I would do is kind of take Break that down. You know, if we were to take um, value orientation, second one down, do you have three to four metrics to determine your value creation for your customers? Answer that, you know, honestly. Um, and then if you're at a, a, a three out of five, how can you make yourself a four? How can you make a five? And it's not something that's just going to change overnight. It is something that you're going to have to constantly improve upon. But you can do that for every single one of these areas, right? So I'll leave that with you because I think this is a really good tool that aids with self-reflection on the onboard in the onboarding process. Okay, so I'm going to move on to um, optimizing the process. Here are things that I do when I am thinking about the onboarding process. Firstly, lock yourself away. And I think it's worth just kind of removing all the distractions from Slack and Teams and emails and all those kind of things. But when you're thinking about the onboarding process, Start with the customer in mind. What is the value that we are trying to deliver? 
what's the best experience that the customer would want. So put yourself in their shoes. Forget about what is going to be easiest for you, right? The customer is buying a service from you. Make sure that you can deliver that value and make sure that the customer is going to be happy, right? And then work back from there, okay? Once you've got the ideal process from a customer's perspective, you can then start to make your processes a little bit easier as well. Okay. Think about, um, think about the swan, that old, um, that old adage that as a swan's crossing the lake, it looks really smooth and calm and collected, but underneath his legs are going crazy. It's okay for your legs to go crazy, but just make sure that, that the swan is going across gracefully. And that's what the customer sees. Okay. Um, what I would also do is is have a think about how you differentiate to deliver appropriate value. I, I would love to provide white glove, top class, amazing, sit down, hold your hand, literally at the desk next to you, onboarding experience for every single customer. But that's just not possible. You know, we don't have all the time in the world. Um, and, and we have to be fairly honest with ourselves that some customers pay more and we need to keep certain customers more than we keep others. And I, I sound bad saying that, but I think we need to be kind of fairly open and honest with, with that. So think about what the different levels of value that you are going to be providing for the different um, levels of onboarding and different you know, types of customer. And finally, if you were to get um, an increase of 100, 200, 300% of, of your customers, are each one of your processes scalable, right? Where's the bottleneck? What else can you do? Um, to, you know, using automation or, or whatever it might be to help you with scaling this process. Um, and I'll just share with you, this is these, these are a couple of free tools, really good tools that I use. Um, Mindomo, just for, for mind maps, stick onboarding in the middle, create some branches off the, the side of it and just go through. And it might be even taking these bits here, right? Creating, creating a mind map of, of everything and throwing your ideas in there always thinking about these things here you know start with the customer how do we differentiate and as it's is it scalable and draw io which is i think it's now like diagrams.net is um is a, a flow chart maker it's free and you can literally kind of put blocks down for the for the process flow right so when we get a new customer what happens we send them an email who sends them an email is it sales is it cs um is it other right? Who, who updates the CRM? What happens in the CRM? Is there any automation? You can map out the entire process. Um, and that kind of brings us on to the next part where we talk about the internal processes. Um, and actually, I'm going to, I'm going to start with the, the, the bottom right in, instead. Okay. So when we talk about documenting the playbooks, this is incredibly important. So once you've mapped out your, your process flow, get it into your playbook, use Notion or, or, or whatever it might be, get that in a central location so that your team, you know, new people who join the team know exactly what your process is. Your existing team knows what the process is. And if things change, they've got a central place to be able to go and update it and see what, what the changes are. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, I think when, you, when you're building out these processes, play devil's advocate, right? Think about, which of these processes could fail at a certain point, okay? So give give this process to somebody else. Go and say, go and have a look at this. Um, can you see any examples where a certain customer would, would fall through the cracks and perhaps be be lost in a process? Because that's, that's a terrible thing. You forget about a customer for a couple of weeks, especially during the onboarding process. Yeah, you, you, it's bad news, right? Um so I've got a star next to the sales handoff because I'm going to come back to that one next. But in terms of business systems, I think all your business systems should be there to support the process. Like that's there to work for you, not for you to spend all your time just kind of entering data. So think about think about that. Um, and it's a really easy way in, in a number of business systems to start to automate some things, be it emails, be it um, contract creation or notifications to your team of um, onboarding uh, projects that are coming to an end or renewals that are coming up and make sure I always make sure that for myself every time I have a call I always just pop it in the CRM right I, I, I forget things 
as everybody does, but you stick things in the CRM. You've got full history as to what's gone on. Um, you can remind yourself of the conversations that have been had. Um, and the good thing about that is it, it leads on to the reporting bit. The reporting bit is fantastic from a management's perspective. Um, it's, reporting isn't the most exciting thing in the world, but honestly, from from like leaders, managers, leaders, C-suite, they, they need that reporting. They need to know that things are going well, that the, on, the onboarding process is going well. Um, so there's there's that side of things, making sure that the business is ticking along. But then there's also um, the the reflective element, which areas of the onboarding process are taking longer than, longer than others. And the last one we're going to talk to you on this is, is about continuous review. So if you were to get, for example, a new member of the team in the onboarding team, put them through the onboarding process as if they were a customer, get them to experience it like a customer would, right? Get their feedback. You're bringing them on because they've got experience, right? Use the experience. Also talk to them about how did onboarding work at your last company? What went well? What did you enjoy delivering? And perhaps what didn't go so well? What would you make changes to that to, into, in your previous company? Is there anything you'd make some changes on here? Okay, I'm going to have to speed up because I think we're going to kind of run over time. But um, so when it comes to welcoming the customer, make sure you know who's sending out the communications. It doesn't matter if it's going to be the salesperson who wants to continue the conversation post-sale into introducing the customer success team, or if it's the implementation consultant who wants to step in and set up the first call, make sure it doesn't really matter, but make sure that um, that the email or the whatever's going out to the customer is consistent for everybody. You include key information that you want to convey and possibly even collect and that brings me down to the, the the information gathering section, right? You might want to use things like Google or Microsoft Forms if you've got some some standard um, key bits of information that you need to gather from your customers. It might be tax codes, it might be charge out rates, it might be whatever it might be um, that's going to help you set up the customer system and get them going quicker. Think about standardizing some of those that, that information gathering here. Um, again, kickoff call. I'm going to come back to you in, in, in just one moment. Um, customer success plans for me is, is a really big one because sometimes you, you might write this up in an, in an onboarding plan as well. It goes back to a point I was saying earlier. Make sure you understand the value. What are the values that the economic buyer at your customer site is, is wanting to get? Right. That's really, 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 really key. In the past, I have spent time you know, focusing very much on what the person in front of me is asking of. Right. And it's great. We're going in a really good direction and we've got a great relationship. But lessons learned. Right. You step back and the economic buyer, the person who's got the power to influence whether this is going to renew or whether this is going to continue, turns around and said, OK, well, I purchased this because I wanted that. And you're doing some really good things over there, but you're not delivering on that. That that person there, that's somebody you really, really need to listen to and make sure that you are continuously having that in your mind. And also pushing back on, on your customer in some cases. If they're going, we want to go over here. No, I'm sorry. I've spoken to this person. They need that value before we can do anything else. Um, and then most of the bottom, the, the, from deliver training through to overlay tools, is, it's all about education right? And you have to think about the, what the best combination of training tactics are or is to educate customers and improve adoption. And you need to consider that people learn in different ways. So make sure you diversify your material between written explanations, video walkthroughs, activities, uh, ask the expert sessions, all those kind of things. So these are the things that I would think about in terms of the, the sales handover. And again, very much depends on the organization and what the product is. But straight away, I want to know who the customer is. What do they do? You know, what industry are in? What do they sell? What makes them tick? Um, what's the size of the company? Is there room for, again, I'm going to try and to gauge the size of um, the, the growth opportunities in here as well. Who are the key contacts? Who's going to be the, the advocate um, and who's responsible for the success of your product on the customer side? Um, who's a technical lead? I've mentioned about the economic buyer. 
And um, and then I want to know, set the scene. Tell me what problems have the customer got? How big are those problems? And are there any compelling events? Is there anything that's, that a government agency or someone has said, you need to have X in place by this date, otherwise you're going to be having fines, right? That's quite important to know. Um, and one thing I would say about... Um, about that, actually, I'm going to make another point, but I'll come back to that on the um, on the kickoff section. Okay, so um, talking about the sales process, why did we win? Who were we up against, if anyone? Why did they pick us over the competitors? Are there, is there something that that we do better than the others? Are there certain bits of functionality or features that give us gives us the the added value? Um, was there a proof of concept? What was covered? What did we deliver? What was what was the customer looking for? What were they trying to prove out? Um, and then kind of more of some more of the transactional bits. Um, what what they purchased? You know, what, what could they purchase next? Uh, what's the next value? Like once we've delivered value here and they're happy, what's the next thing? Where do we? Where else do we take this? Um, and are there any risks that we need to be aware of? Okay, and I think it's worth mentioning that. It's okay to show your personality and and um, and really be enthusiastic on the calls, right? It's being enthusiastic and showing your personality is not unprofessional. And 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 I say that because I, I, a lot of the times in the past I've seen people be fairly robotic with things, and I don't know if that's because they're nervous might might be the reason why. Um, but um, yeah, it's okay to show your personality. Um, and then lastly, a kickoff. These are the things that are kind of, yeah, the last bit was probably more more relevant to this slide, right? Um, introductions and expectations. It's okay if customer comes to the kickoff call without any expectations, um, but ask them what their expectations of the call. Make sure you meet them on the call. Things like introduction to your company and maybe even a system demonstration might be relevant if the people on the call have not been involved in the, um, the POC process. Um, Otherwise, the, the most important thing for me, two things here, goals and objectives, what are their goals and by when, and lines of communication. Do you want to create a Slack channel, a Teams channel to communicate with them? If they've got a question about finance, about support, about product, about whatever it might be, tell them who they need to talk to and how they can contact them. And I think that's it, kind of right right at the last, and I don't know if we've got much in the way of time left. Um, but yeah, Shreya, have we got any questions? Um, so, yeah, so we are just about of time now, but we can take one question. Um, so I have a question from an attendee. Any tips for managing onboarding where third parties involved like partner or service providers? I, I had this um, at the last company I worked for. Um, firstly, I would treat them as if they're just another consultant, right? They're just an extension to your team. Provide them with all the material they need or the training. If you train up your consultants, train these guys. Just involve them as if they're part of your team, right? Um, I would also, sometimes you might want to kind of enforce a process on them. Say, so make sure you cover these here. But you're bringing them on as a consultant or as a third party, because they've got expertise in these areas. So it's okay to let them have a bit of creative freedom as long as you kind of give them some guidelines and some boundaries um, and make sure that there is a regular, uh, you know, an easy way for regular reporting and updates to come to the client and yourself. So you, you still maintain a level of control because at the end of the day, it's still your customer. 